to extract uh, uh, correlation func uh, spectral functions from Monte Carlo, I want to discuss uh, uh, Bayes' theorem and how it's uh, applied in this analytic continuation problems. Okay, so what is an analytic continuation? Basically, it's uh, it, it's the meaning it has in in mathematics that we uh, rotate something into the complex plane. So we 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 basically would like real-time information, but we can only get imaginary time information in quantum Monte Carlo, and then we need to rotate that back to the uh, real axis, okay? So I, I will quickly review some of the methods that people have come up with to, to do that, uh, and then I want to focus on a recent uh, approach uh, that I'm, I have been involved in. Actually, it goes back, uh, you know, some time, but there are some recent developments. And uh, scattered, uh, you know, throughout this talk uh, will be some applications. There will be some tests, uh, you know, where we know what the results should be. And then there will be some, uh, some applications where, uh, you know, from a, an experimental perspective, people are quite interested in knowing what the results should be. So, even in the case of the well-known 2D spin one-half uh, Heisenberg model, it turns out that there are open questions and very interesting uh, prospects uh, for, for what the dynamics really is, what, what, meaning what really is the nature of the elementary excitations in the system. Uh, okay, so, and, and, so, and also there's some interesting things going on in three-dimensional uh, systems. Okay, spectral functions. So, in, in, we would like to uh, look at uh, time dependence. So we, 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 in principle, can look at some time dependent correlation function. So we have some operator at uh, time zero, and we want to know how that's correlated to the adjoint of that operator at some other time. So for example, in, when we talk about quantum magnets, often the operator we are interested in is just the Fourier transform of the spin operator, so we could take, for example, the Z component uh, of that operator, just to give you an example of what, what this O could be. It could also be something more complicated. Okay, so now we would like to Fourier transform that to, to the frequency domain. So we just uh, do the Fourier transform. Well, by the way, I should say, sometimes when you see things like that, you will see that there's a time ordering uh, in front of there. Uh, so th that, that maybe should be the case, but uh, I think what I'm doing when I'm leaving that out will at least be okay when we talk about bosonic operators. So uh, I don't want to get too mathematical here, so I, I skip some details, but in, uh, or maybe make some simplifications, but the end result is correct. So we have this time correlation function, we Fourier transform it, and then uh, to look at uh, you know, what this is, uh, I want to go into or let's say another way to write it, in, in the basis of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So these m's and n's uh, uh, and, uh, refer to uh, the eigenstates of the system I'm looking at. So these are the eigen uh, energies of the system. Okay, so now if you look at an expression like that, you will see that it contains uh, a representation of the delta function. So this is one way to represent the delta function as an uh, uh, exponential over all times in this case. So if we just substitute that, we get uh, what we call the spectral function. So I could also have just started with this and, and you know, not, not even told you about this, because this kind of spectral function appears you know, in many uh, cases in physics if you are interested in, uh, in uh, transition rates and things like that. So for example, in, in, uh, in, in neutron scattering, if we take this operator here, this is a directly proportional to the scattering cross-section when you transfer uh, momentum Q. So you see this has a momentum Q. So if I put that in here, it, it corresponds to the uh, cross-section of scattering at momentum transfer Q and energy transfer uh, omega, okay? So we are interested in spectral functions of that form. Now, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, numerics, often we work with finite systems, and if you do exact diagonalization, uh, or even in the Lanchos uh, method that we talked about before, uh, 
you can calculate these things. You just uh, uh, get it directly. But the form that you get it in, if the system is small, it's really you know a sum of delta functions, right? So each delta function has some amplitude, uh, which is you know this matrix element squared. Uh, and if the system is small, you know the, the number of delta functions can also be really quite uh, quite small. So you may uh, get from your exact diagonalization uh, something like that. But what happens if you increase the system size, which maybe you are not able to do if you uh, do exact diagonalization, but at least in principle, if you increase the system sizes uh, very quickly, you will get lots of delta functions here, meaning you know bill millions and billions and, and so on. Uh, and then effectively, it becomes a, a continuous uh, uh, spectrum. So you can uh, look at that in different ways. You can say, OK, let's put a little bit of broadening in each of these delta functions. Then if you have you know, thousands of them, uh, that even with very little broadening, uh, you will get a continuous spectrum. Or you can say, OK, let's pick a small window of frequencies here on this axis and just collect all the weight within uh, that window and then do that for other windows. Then if you have, you know, again, m maybe millions or billions of delta functions there, when you do that, you will get an essentially smooth spectrum. So I think these are things that you are familiar with uh, uh, from before as well in, 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 in quantum mechanics, for example. Uh, OK, so the point is we want to calculate these uh, spectral functions in some way. Uh, and we would like to do it for you know, pretty big systems, not just what we can do with exact diagonalizations. Uh, so before talking more about uh, uh, how to do that, let me uh, give some uh, uh, example of the, uh, really the kind of spectral function I will look at in, in all the examples today. So that's the dynamic spin structure factor, S of Q and omega. And it uh, is based on exactly the operator I already uh, discussed. So it could be the Fourier transform of the uh, spin Z component, or it could be the Fourier component of this uh, you know, S plus uh, ladder operator, it, or it could be SX or a, 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 SY. Uh, uh, I will, in practice, discuss uh, uh, you know, Heisenberg models where it doesn't really matter which one you choose. The, the result will be the same because of the spin uh, rotation uh, symmetry. Uh, but that that with that operator, you get really uh, the, the structure factor that you look at in neutron scattering. So let me give, uh, just to, to, to give you an example from, from the real world, let's look at some uh, experimental results for uh, a spin ladder system. So this particular compound here, <coughs> where you, know, you have uh, uh, ladders of spin. So there, there's a spin one half in each of these lattice points. And they are coupled you know, with each other with some coupling indicated with red here. And there's also some coupling uh, in, in this direction. Okay. So here are some results that I took from, from this paper here. So you see, uh, since uh, th this has this ladder geometry, you can define even and odd modes. So you, can, you have a, a reflection symmetry if you reflect the uh, lower chain to the upper chain. So you can uh, think of that as even and, and odd. Uh, you have an even or, uh, and odd mode. Uh, so that's how these things are, are labeled here. Or okay, here, here they're called symmetric and anti-symmetric, or asymmetric, I guess. So that corresponds to the even uh, and odd mode. Uh, so this is the, the scattering uh, intensity as a function of the normalized momentum. So in, in, uh, if, we, if the lattice spacing is, is one, we would normally say that the momentum goes from, from zero to, to uh, pi, uh, sorry, uh, two pi, I guess, in this case, zero to two pi. So this is the, the scattering at, at uh, pi, which corresponds to the antiferromagnetic uh, uh, wave vector. So you see that there's a lot of structure here, and most of the scattering is uh, in the asymmetric channel close to pi. So that's really reflecting uh, strong antiferromagnetic correlations in this system. But this system is not actually ordered, so you don't really have, have spin waves, but you have still some, some uh, scattering in intensity that reflects 
uh, some, some modes in the system. <clears throat> and you actually should have a gap. There should be a gap in the spectrum here. So the, the lowest uh, point where you get scattering should be, you know, not at zero, but lifted a little bit. So I think you can see that here that the maximum at least is not at zero. Uh, what they have here, I'm not sure. I think this is not related to the ladder physics. So this is a, a theoretical calculation here uh, to the right. Yeah, so you can think of it as uh, your modes. Uh, you, you can define modes uh, that are symmetric or asymmetric with, reflect, with respect to reflecting this, this uh, chain. You can also think of it as, if you think of this as periodic boundary conditions in this direction, then it's just uh, the transverse momentum zero or pi, right? <clears throat> because those are the only wave numbers you have if you have only, you know, a size two in, in, in that direction. Right, so this theoretical calculation here is done uh, with the DMRG method, the density matrix uh, RG method, where one can now uh, do, uh, in one dimension at least, uh, one can do time evolution, and you can actually compute those real-time correlations, and you can do the Fourier transform uh, to get, uh, you know, these spectral functions. So you see that these match quite well. So this is for some uh, optimized value of this coupling in, in the theoretical calculation. Yes, please. Uh, maybe you are not the right person to ask, but I would like to come back to the Ganesh question. So is this experiment made in zero field? Magnetic this field. is in zero field. If yes. it is in zero field and these are spin one halves, right. then on a single one we can have either singlet or triplets. I guess the ground state is when they are all in singlets. That's right. Then the excitation is a triplet. Yeah, so these measures measure the triplet excitation. Right, so then we should expect a free fall degenerate mode in one of the either symmetric or asymmetric channels. Right. And in that case, the other channel is something non trivial. So I don't understand how you do this symmetrization or anti-symmetrization along well, the Okay, line. but the symmetrization and anti-symmetrization is, that, that, that doesn't have to do with the spin, that has to do with the, uh, really, the geometry of the lattice. Right, I mean, that, 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 if you think about the triplet, yeah. I mean, singlet will be, say, anti-symmetric and the triplet excitation will be symmetric. No, I don't think that's, I mean, you have triplets in, the, in both channels. But then they are degenerate. Uh, no, I don't think they are. Because you have SU2 symmetry. Yeah, but that symmetry doesn't have anything to do with the symmetry of, of, uh, of, of this lattice, right? Um, the Yes, I, I don't see any, uh, maybe we can discuss after, but basically, <coughs> you know, what, where, what are these triplets? Well, you can break these uh, singlet bonds, okay, and excite them in, into the triplet, okay? That looks like the triplet should be symmetric, maybe that's what you refer to. Yeah. But, but there are couplings here too, so, you know, the triplet can also sit on, on the bonds here. And that would be, I, 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 I mean, what I'm concerned, I mean, if, if you co compare the energies in symmetric and asymmetric channel, they're roughly, I mean, the top of the band is around 2.5. Right. So it means that, okay, one would like to know what are the J's, in, uh, I mean, the bond J's. Yeah, so, so the, I think in this experiment or, or in this calculation, <coughs> the J here is roughly twice the J here. So, you know, they are pretty similar. So if you do just some you know, simple model of a, you know, triplet that can sit on each of these bonds. You already, you know, capture a lot of this, actually. Okay, maybe we can discuss after. <clears throat> um, but, uh, yeah, uh, uh, there, there are definitely uh, even and odd uh, triplet modes uh, in, in this system, and you can uh, detect them this way. So the reason it's a triplet, of, I mean, when you act with this op any of these operators, on the singlet, you know, it, it becomes a triplet with momentum Q, so that's what you 
Yeah, these are the MRG calculations. Uh, okay, so yeah, so okay, so the, the overall there's a pretty good uh, agreement here, right? But uh, <clears throat> uh, the intensity here becomes very low, and I think it may even have something to do with the fact that uh, the chain is finite and the time is finite. So, so maybe you know uh, there's something that's not captured well here. But I, I think there is some intensity there. It's just very low. But there are some things that are really not captured. I think that it looks like there's a a little bit of a, a mode there, which is not seen here. <clears throat> so that may be something which is beyond the Hamiltonian that is uh, looked at here. Uh, okay, so, so that was just a, a motivation why we want to do these calculations. <clears throat> okay, and okay, this was done with DMRG. I'm not going to discuss DMRG, but DMRG cannot really be used to get results like this in two dimensions, only in, uh, in one dimension. Okay, so let's let's look at what we can do with with quantum Monte Carlo. So then we can <coughs> cannot really com compute real time correlation functions because of the phases and, and so on. It's just impossible. Uh, but we can compute imaginary time correlations. So what what is that? Okay, so this is the real time correlation that we would like to have, and now what we can do is we can go to imaginary time. So we just say okay. Let's evaluate this at time t equals minus i times tau, where tau is a real number. <clears throat> so then this is what we get. Uh, OK. So then we have to ask, what is the relationship of this imaginary time correlation to the real sp frequency spectral function that we are interested in? So this was the relationship between real time and real frequency. And now if you just apply uh, this here, uh, you see that, that this is uh, the relationship between imaginary time correlation functions and the real frequency spectrum. OK? <clears throat> so this is now what we uh, would like to invert, right? So we compute this, and we would like s of omega. So if, if we have s of omega, it's very easy to get g of tau. We, we just do this, this integral, right? But for this kind of uh, integral relationship, there's no closed form for the inverse transform. It's similar to a Laplace transform, right? So in some special cases, you know, for this function, you can do it, but in, in general, you know, there, there's no way to, to write it in, in closed form as some integral or something like that. <clears throat> Unlike the Fourier transform, where we can go in, in either direction very easily. OK, uh, not only that, but we also have incomplete information, right? Because when we compute this numerically, uh, we cannot do it in the time continuum. We, we have to choose. Uh, a set number of time points where we do the calculation, right? <clears throat> uh, and also, since we are doing Monte Carlo simulations, we always have some noise. We have some statistical errors. Uh, so that actually means that, strictly speaking, we cannot even find a unique solution to the inverse problem because uh, of the incomplete information in G of tau. If we have g of tau to infinite precision and at all time points, then in principle, one has a unique uh, you know, s of omega. But with this incomplete information, the inverse is not uniquely defined. OK? So just to be <coughs> concrete here, let me you know, show you some examples of what we would actually have. Uh, yes, please. Oh, truncating, you said. No, what did you say? Uh, yeah. Oh, OK. I should have pointed that out. So uh, <clears throat> when we go to the imaginary time domain, uh, the imaginary time space also is not infinite if we are at finite temperature. So this is related to uh, you know, the path integrals that we discussed uh, the other day. 
that the imaginary time space goes from zero to beta. Uh, and here, here I said, okay, uh, beta divided by two. I should really have said beta. But the point is that uh, the time correlation function is symmetric with respect to beta divided by two. So, uh, you know, we only need to calculate it in, in, in this range, okay? Uh, but then you said truncations, okay. So if uh, beta is very large and, and the correlation function decays very fast, so these correlation functions always, uh, sorry, they, they decay something like this. So g of tau as a function of, let's say, so as I said, it's symmetric with respect to beta over two, so it may look something like that. <clears throat> now, if, if uh, you know, beta is very large here, this, this may, you know, decay to, you know, become extremely small here, so, you know, we cannot even calculate it here to, uh, within our statistical precision, so we may, you know, just truncate it somewhere. Uh, so the data I show you here is, I forget actually where, where <laughs> this is from, but I, I uh, only used, uh, you know, some number of uh, tau points there. <clears throat> and now you can see that I d here I don't even use uh, a uniform grid of time tau points. So you can definitely use uh, a uniform grid, uh, but as we will see in a while, uh, you know, maybe then you get too many time points. Uh, uh, it's, it turns out it's not easy to deal with these things uh, uh, when we have lots of tau points. So you may want some information for short times and, okay, longer times as well, uh, but maybe you don't want to, to do a uniform grid because then you get too many points. So here it's, it's some uh, almost uh, quadratic kind of grid, but not, not exactly. You see it's 0.1, 0.2, 0 0.3, and then at some point it skips uh, some of them and then the distance becomes larger. So it's not actually completely clear what kind of grid is even ideal and that would depend on the problem and if you don't know the result, you, know, you may not know what it is. But in the end, it turns out that it doesn't really matter so much. Yeah? Yeah, so in, in some sense, if beta is uh, very small, you know, then uh, you still probably want, I don't know, 10 or 20 points, so then you would choose uh, maybe a uniform, you know, fine grid to, to get, get those. Uh, it's a bit, I mean, in the end, it's not, not really a problem, but it's a bit annoying in the sense that you really don't know what's the best way to pick these, these points. But, you know, based on tests, and this is, you know, people, things that people have played with for, you know, a, a long time, it, in the end, it doesn't really matter. Actually, maybe I can say already that the, the, pro the whole problem here is that given, you know, the noisy data uh, and the fact that these, the, the errors are also correlated, you, the, you know, we, we get these uh, points from the same simulation, so these, these errors, here I show some statistical errors that look very small, and they are small, but they are also, this doesn't reflect the correlations between uh, the errors. So it turns out that effectively, you know, even if you choose a huge number of, of tau points, the effective number of, uh, let's say, the effective amount of independent information you have is very small. You may have effectively, you know, just let's something like five or ten, uh, uh, you know, time points, even if it looks like you have you, you use a hundred points, and that's because uh, these things are correlated and because of the error bars. <clears throat> okay, so if we have some data set like that and uh, we would like to uh, do the inversion, how, how may we actually go about that? So first, we, we need some way to quantify how good uh, a spectrum is at representing our data. So if, uh, let's say I, I just guess uh, a spectrum and then you can ask, okay, how well does it, uh, you know, reproduce this Monte Carlo result? So I will denote the guess uh, by G S of tau. So given S, uh, you get G S of tau. Uh, okay, so now you can think of 
uh, of sort of a distance between uh, you know, what you have calculated in your simulation and what you get from this guess. And that's just what we call chi-squared in you know, normal uh, data fitting. <laughs> so you just take the uh, difference between uh, the, the point coming from the guest spectrum and the point in your simulation, you square that and you divide by the error bar squared and you sum over all time points. So that's what you always would do if you do some, some data fitting, right? You, you want to, to minimize uh, chi-squared. Uh, now, as I mentioned already, these uh, uh, error bars are, are not independent, or, or I should say the, the, the fluctuations in the data are not independent. So these error bars don't reflect fully uh, the nature of, 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 the, of, the, of the errors. So what one should use and what we uh, always do use uh, is uh, the full covariance matrix. One has to calculate the, uh, not only the, the fluctuations of the indi individual points, but how they fluctuate jointly, and that's what we call the covariance uh, matrix. Okay, let me, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's not, not so important, but it, it captures the, uh, the, the covariance in the system. <clears throat> so if you call that, Covariance matrix Cij, uh, you know, which is the covariance between uh, points i and, and j, let's say. Uh, then we have to invert that matrix uh, and, and evaluate this kind of expression. So this, this expression here, which assumes uh, independent uh, data points, independent random uh, outcomes, uh, that would correspond to, you can say that, that, that you get that if you approximate the covariance matrix to just be a diagonal matrix. But in reality, it, it's not. Okay, but that, that's not so important here. Just remember that, okay, we have this chi-squared, which tells us how well our spectrum uh, reproduces uh, the QMC data. Okay? <clears throat> now, the, the very simplest way you can imagine uh, doing this analytic continuation is really uh, uh, function fitting. So, you would say, okay, let's uh, 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 take some approximate solution and maybe that solution allows you to put in some parameters to make it more flexible or something like that, or you just have some reason to believe that the spectrum should have some particular form. Let's say, for example, in some simple case, maybe you, you suspect that it should just be a Gaussian. But maybe you don't know how <coughs> wide it is or where it's located. So then you have uh, those as free parameters that you would optimize by uh, minimizing chi-squared. <coughs> so let, let me quickly show one example uh, where we did an approach uh, like that with uh, Rajiv Singh uh, several years ago where we were exactly interested in uh, what I already mentioned, the, the uh, structure factor of the 2D Heisenberg model. <clears throat> so so uh, in the previous talk, we already heard about uh, uh, the dispersion relation that you may calculate in mean field theory of a spin system. So you expect so for some uh, momentum, uh, there is some energy of the excitation. Uh, but in, in, in reality, if you go beyond mean field theory, uh, uh, you, you may have actually a continuum of excitations. So, but you may still have a delta function that reflects, uh, let's say, the mean field nature of, uh, of the system. So as a function of omega, your spectral function may have a delta function and then some continue uh, above that. And this will depend on, on the momentum. <clears throat> so you may have some lowest uh, frequency where the delta function is that we call omega q, and then you have a, a, co a continuum. And, and this lowest frequency is what we heard about, uh, or lowest energy, that's what we heard about in the previous talk, an approximation to, to that. But if you go beyond mean field theory, then you would have a continuum. <clears throat> okay, so if we just know then that there should be uh, something like this. So we say, okay, uh, this is a delta function at omega q, and it has some weight. Uh, 
that we treat as a parameter. And then there's a, a continuum uh, above that, something li like this, uh, which has some total weight uh, uh, and, and uh, it has some functional form. And here, just for practical reasons, we, we normalize this thing so that this is really the weight uh, in, in the continuum. <clears throat> okay, uh, okay, then you, you have to say, okay, what is the form of the continuum? Now it turns out that in, in these uh, Heisenberg systems, when you break the symmetry, you can actually define transversal and longitudinal uh, components of uh, this spectral function. So the delta function should be in the transversal component because it reflects uh, the spin waves that corresponds to wiggling these, these spins uh, off their uh, uh, main axis. <clears throat> and then there should also be a longitudinal part, which is reflecting the amplitude fluctuations of the order parameter. Okay, and that should not have a delta function, but it should have some shape. And then what we did in, in this work, we just made some simple assumptions for uh, the forms of these uh, continua. Uh, just some truncated Gaussian uh, and some more flexible form for the lo longitudinal one. It's not so important for this purpose what, what, it, what it actually is. <clears throat> but then the point is that we have some parameters here. You see there are some parameters. Uh, and then we just, uh, you know, for given Q, we just optimize those parameters to minimize uh, the chi-squared uh, function. Okay, let me just flash some of the results. <clears throat> and I will actually come back, back later on to, to this problem you know, where we have used uh, more sophisticated uh, methods, but it turns out that these results that we, we already got are, are actually pretty, pretty good still. <clears throat> so then we have to look at things as a function of the system size, and uh, for some reason that I maybe will uh, explain more later, we looked at two particular uh, momenta, and those are the momenta where in spin wave theory the energy is the highest. Uh, and then we looked at the, the size, the relative size of the delta function at those different momenta as a function of the system size. And we looked at this, uh, you know, this location of this delta function also as a function of, of the size. So in spin wave theory, this should actually, this should be uh, degenerate. The energy should be the same, but in, in reality, they are not. Okay, and then we got some, some spectral functions that we, we, we presented. Uh, and they look like this, and I will come back and, and discuss this a bit, a bit more later. <clears throat> so this can be very useful for experiments, and in fact, uh, you know, neutron scatterers have uh, often compared their results with, with, with these and, and other uh, similar results. Uh, okay, but here you, we may still worry that we assume these, these uh, particular uh, functional forms uh, of, of these continua here. Um, so these results are not completely unbiased, although they actually fit the data very well. So these, these spectral functions that are shown here give, uh, you know, chi-squared, the minimum chi-squared is uh, of the order that you would expect um, uh, statistically. <clears throat> so, so we cannot detect anything wrong, but still it's not completely unbiased. So let's discuss some uh, procedures that you would use if you don't want to impose anything uh, from the outset. Yes? Can uh, Right, so, so omega uh, uh, has to be positive. So it turns out that if you are at zero temperature, there's no negative weight uh, in the spectrum at all. Uh, and if you are at finite temperature, this for um, now it de depends on if you are dealing with a bosonic or fermionic spectral function. But for bosons or for bosonic systems, uh, S of let's say omega is positive, and you want to, to know the relationship between positive and and negative frequencies. <coughs> um, that the shape is essentially the same. It's just uh, there's this Boltzmann uh, factor that tells you how they are related. But omega itself, if I understood you correctly, cannot be negative. It, that was your question, right? Yeah. 
<clears throat> because, uh, I mean, that would mean that the ground state is unstable, if, if it even would make sense, but omega is the ec excitation, lowest excitation energy, right, from the ground state, so it, it should be a positive number. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so if we don't want, want to impose anything, we need some uh, functional form that is extremely flexible, right? Uh, and one very, very flexible form is that you take a huge number of delta functions uh, and just give them some amplitudes. And then you can again say, well, if I have a huge number of them, uh, if I just uh, broaden the delta functions a little bit, then you get a continuous spectrum, right? So even if, if it's a sum of, a del of many delta functions, that's still a very uh, general form if you just think of broadening a, a little bit. So you can, can have something like that. <clears throat> so this was is just some made up uh, figure with, you know, I don't know, 50 or 100 delta functions. And the, you can think of the height uh, as the amplitude of the delta function. So then you can just think of the whole spectrum as, as just the curve connecting uh, those amplitudes, right? So that's what you would get basically if you broaden uh, the delta functions a little bit. Uh, okay, so that's what has often be been used. <clears throat> so let's, let's look at how we can deal with, with such a thing. So now you may, may say, okay, now we should just do uh, chi-squared minimization. We should find the, the best uh, amplitudes there, just optimize uh, the fit in the same way as we did before. Uh, but now the difference is that now we may have you know, hundreds of delta functions. So we have hundreds of parameters to, to determine. In the previous example, I only had four or five uh, parameters, something like that. So in that case, it was relatively easy to, to get, uh, you know, unique values of, uh, of those parameters. But if we have many of them, it turns out that because of the uh, ill-posed nature of the problem when, when we have limited and noisy data. There are actually many uh, choices of those amplitudes that give almost the same <coughs> and, 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 and close to the optimal value of uh, the chi-squared function. <clears throat> so you, you may, and this is just some made up stuff again, but so for example, these two spectra that look you know, quite different, uh, they may fit the data equally well. Uh, and if you try to find the very best uh, uh, function, very best uh, set of amplitudes, it may actually be very hard to find, and it may actually look completely crazy and be very wrong, which I will tell you in a moment. Uh, but the main message here is that uh, the ill-posedness of the problem means that there are many solutions that are almost equally good. And if you just do something like that, there is no really way to tell what, what uh, the best one is. <clears throat> so we need some way to regularize or smoothen the spectrum. So if you just do you know, hundreds of delta functions like this, normally the solutions we get are not very smooth. So you can imagine that if you impose some smoothing on top of that, then maybe you can find a unique solution. <clears throat> okay, so that's where uh, we should discuss Bayes' uh, theorem a little bit. So that's, that's in probability uh, theory, and I think many of you uh, probably have uh, seen this before. So if we just have random events A and B, this is what, what the theorem is. So P of A and P of B, that just refers to the overall probabilities of those events. <clears throat> While P of A bar B means uh, the probability that A happens if B already has happened, uh, and vice versa for P, B, A. So it's the conditional probability, the probability of A under the condition that B uh, has happened. <clears throat> Okay, so what one could try to do is to apply this to the analytic continuation problem. So you could say, okay, uh, the spectral function that we are looking for uh, is a 
sort of random variable. It's a very complicated one, uh, but in principle, you know, it's characterized by some, you know, for example, these amplitudes, and you can think of, of those as some, or S collectively as some uh, random event with outcomes corresponding to, to those amplitudes. <clears throat> and you can, you know, maybe think of, of the correlation function G as some random event as well. I mean, certainly it's a stochastic thing that we uh, generate in our simulation. So from uh, what we would really like to know is that given uh, our calculated function g, we would like to know what is the probability of uh, a given spectrum. Because if we have that, then we could maximize that probability, for example, and say, okay, this is the, the best spectrum because it's the one that uh, maximizes the probability given our uh, uh, g of tau. <clears throat> okay, so in principle, it's easy to, you know, rewrite that equation for that. Uh, but what are these three functions here? Okay, so one of them is easy, P of GS, meaning given a spectrum, what is the probability that we get uh, a, a certain uh, G of tau function? Well, that's exactly given by this chi-squared function. So this is just from uh, statistics. That if, if uh, uh, chi-squared is large, then you know that it would be unlikely to 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 get such a g given s, uh, and vice versa. If chi squared is small, that would be a likely un, uh, outcome. Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. Exactly. So, so that's under the assumption of Gaussian fluctuations. Yeah, <coughs> uh, which. Uh, at least for, for G, uh, you know, that assumption, if we deal with the simulation correctly, that, that should hold. The fluctuations above the mean are Gaussian. Okay, there, we have correlated noise, but if we cal calculate the covariance matrix and go to uh, the basis where the uh, covariance matrix is diagonal, then we have uh, Gaussian fluctuations. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> how about P of G? Okay, what that, that, does, that, does that mean? The probability of this correlation function. Uh, uh, we don't know what that is. Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm even wondering if it's a, a nonsensical question. I mean, it seems a little bit strange that if, if you have no other information, what is the probability of a, a given G of tau? Uh, I, I don't know what that means. <clears throat> and I think that's why uh, in all the approaches, people, you know, brush this under the carpet and we just say, okay, we don't know it, so let's just say it's a constant, meaning that all outcomes of G are equally likely unless we have any other uh, information. <clears throat> That's right, but, but, but here you have to think of it in another way, that, that before you do any simulation at all, what is the probability of G, right? This is what it means if you think of, of Bayes' theorem here, right? So when you have done the simulation, uh, you know, you have a spectrum, but you don't know what it is, but there is some underlying spectrum. And so when you do the simulation, you, you know, you, you do this, you, you have a, a spectrum, you don't know it, but in principle there is, and then there's a, some probability of getting your spectral function. Okay, but if you don't do a simulation, what is the probability of, of G? It seems nonsensical, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it would be something about the whole space of all possible Green's functions that you could ever get, but I don't know anything about that. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a very, but, okay, but there's a similar question you can ask about P of S, the spectral function. <clears throat> but there at least you can say some, some things. You can say, okay, uh, we know that the spectrum has to be positive definite. That, that's one thing that you can, you know, impose. Uh, and then, as I will discuss in a little bit later, you know, people 
have all, some ideas about you know, how you should, if you have two different spectra, and they are, you know, in, in terms of chi-squared, equally good, you can say from, from, from some criterion that this one should still be more likely than that one. But it's, it's a similar question. <clears throat> but we will get back to that one. So we, we don't know P of S, uh, but as we will discuss uh, in, a, in a moment, one can at least uh, say some things about it. So the different analytic continuation methods have to do with, you know, different ways of dealing with these uh, unknowns. So the maximum entropy method is, is the most uh, well known. <clears throat> so what you do, do there to, to, to you know, define a P of S is to use some entropy arguments. So this is the information uh, theoretical entropy, the von Neumann kind of entropy. Uh, and it's defined with respect to what's called a default function. So here, uh, the, the uh, advocates of this method, they, they say, okay, D of omega is something that builds in some prior information you have uh, about the spectrum. <clears throat> so for example, you may have done some approximate calculation and you say, okay, if I don't do anything else, that's my answer. So then you measure your entropy with respect to that default model. <clears throat> so if, if the spectrum is equal to the default model, then you get zero. There's, uh, and that's the maximum value of the uh, entropy. Uh, if you, the spectrum looks a little bit different, then there is some entropy in the spectrum, meaning that there is some information in it beyond you know, uh, what you, uh, your default is. <clears throat> okay, so that, that's what people call the entropic uh, prior. Uh, right, okay, so if you, you can also say that the default model is just a flat, it's just some, some constant if you don't want to impose anything. But even imposing a flat uh, default is doing something. Okay, <clears throat> yep. That's right. Uh, okay, so normally you also impose the positive definiteness. So you say, okay, I just consider uh, positive definiteness. But you could uh, let it be negative, but then I guess you would have to put an absolute value there. Yeah. It's a physical constraint. For, the, for these kinds of spectral functions that we're looking at, it's a physical constraint. There are other spectral functions that can be negative, but if you have a spectral function of the type, uh, you know, operator, at time zero and the adjoint operator at some other time, then the spectral function is, is positive, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so if you combine, you know, with what we looked at in the previous page, then uh, the, the total probability distribution that you deal with uh, look like this. Okay, but now there's a problem here because there's an unknown constant here, so this entropic argument you can use uh, up to some unknown uh, constant. <clears throat> so what you would maximize uh, if you want to maximize the probability is alpha times the entropy minus chi squared but alpha is, uh, is not known. Uh, uh, but this entropy does have the effect of uh, smoothing. So uh, if alpha is very large, if you uh, uh, maximize this, you, you get uh, the default model itself, which normally would be smooth. <clears throat> if alpha is very small, you, you get what we had before with just chi-squared fitting and then the spectra are you know, not very well defined and they are not smooth. Uh, but for some reasonable values of alpha, you get some smooth spectra and, uh, uh, and this method may work quite well actually. <clears throat> uh, so there are I will not actually discuss how to choose this alpha, but uh, there are different variants of the Maxent method that chooses alpha, that choose alpha in different ways. <clears throat> okay, so as I mentioned, this is probably the most uh, uh, used approach. Uh, some of, of us believe that this entropy is uh, biasing the spectrum too much uh, towards uh, you know, smooth solutions. Uh, so, for example, it's well known that you cannot resolve edges, sharp peaks, and so on. Everything will be uh, 
very smooth. So one can try to do something else. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, there should be chi squared divided by two here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Thanks. I should correct that. <clears throat> okay, I will show some results eventually as well. I'm just discussing a bit now about this method. So uh, another approach, uh, which I have been, uh, you know, working on myself uh, on and off since 1998, almost 20 years ago, uh, is what we call stochastic analytic continuation. Uh, so there's one line of, of this approach uh, up here, and then there's a slightly different uh, approach, which is also sto stochastic uh, uh, approach by, by this group here. Um, so the, the idea in, uh, in, 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 in the first line here, not in the second one, is to, to do a sampling of the spectrum in a way that looks a little bit what you would do in uh, statistical mechanics. So this would be your probability distribution. So now you can think of, uh, uh, you know, the, this, these uh, delta function amplitudes as your configuration space, and you can do a Monte Carlo simulation, and you introduce some fictitious uh, sampling temperature. <clears throat> so then you see that uh, chi squared divided by two acts as an energy in, in, in statistical mechanics. And the idea of doing that would be that, okay, these individual spectra may be uh, very rough looking, but when you take the average over many of them, you will get something that's smooth. And by choosing this temperature, you can make sure that uh, the solutions are good, meaning that chi squared uh, is good. That's exactly like in, <clears throat> in statistical mechanics, when you reduce the temperature, you reduce the energy, right? So reducing this theta will reduce the mean value of, of chi squared, so you can get increasingly well-fitting solutions. Okay, so, so that, that's the basic point. And let me flash some figure from, uh, from this very old paper. Probably the paper is older than some of the audience, but anyway. Um, so here I, I show uh, different curves. So what do they mean? Uh, so th these are results for a Heisenberg chain, and they are uh, obtained at a pretty high temperature. Uh, and they are obtained for a very small system for which I could do an exact diagonalization. And as I mentioned before, if you do a small system, the actual spectrum is really a pretty small number of delta functions. Uh, if the temperature is higher, you get you know, more delta functions. So that's the reason why I, I ch chose a high temperature here. But then I represent the spectrum as a, the exact spectrum as a, as a histogram with some bin width. <clears throat> and you can see that you know, there's some structure here which is just due to the fact that the system is so small. If we do a bigger system, everything would, would look smooth. Anyway, so when I use the Maxent method on this one, I got these dashed lines, and these are for two different momenta, by the way. So these dashed curves are from the Maxent method. And these other results, which are, are points with error bars, are from you know, sampling the spectrum. <clears throat> and, and let me not get into how I chose the temperature and so on, but uh, you can see that it at least look, it looks a bit, little bit better than, than the Maxent approach. OK, so I found that quite promising, but then I actually didn't work on, on this for a long time. But in the meantime, other people did, and, and uh, there were quite a few groups that actually use this approach for some applications. <clears throat> um, so, but then I actually got back to, to working on this uh, recently, and then I looked at a paper by, by Silios, and where he also made some further improvements uh, on this stochastic approach. <clears throat> and what he proposed is that, okay, we should actually not worry about this uh, fictitious temperature. So it turns out that the way I had proposed and other people had proposed to you for how to choose this data, it's a bit time consuming in the computer to, to adjust it. So he proposed that we should just use uh, theta equals one. And that just corresponds to uh, you know, this base Bayesian approach if you say just P of S is also a constant, or you know, P of S is one, I guess. Or it should be constant, I guess. Uh, so then, uh, because Bayes' theorem would actually not give you this temperature that I uh, talked about in the previous slide. Uh, 
Okay, so, so then I thought, okay, that's great because that makes life much easier. We don't have to worry about uh, this temperature anymore. Let's just set it to one and, and everything is okay. <clears throat> but then I realized that it, it leads to a problem. So you may ask what happens you know, when I have all these delta functions and if I go to a really large number of delta functions, you can even ima imagine taking the limit of uh, that number going to infinity. Uh, so I did some tests on a particular case, uh, which is the one-dimensional Heisenberg chain, uh, for which the beta ansatz can actually give you essentially the exact spectrum. So this is at some particular uh, momentum. <clears throat> so in the Heisenberg chain, since we have deconfined spinners, this was discussed by John Chalker yesterday as well. Uh, we, we have a, actually a, a no delta function, there's a continuum but there's still a sharp peak. Uh, and this is exactly what's really hard to, to uh, resolve in, in these methods. <clears throat> so if you just do this sampling and take the average for different number of delta functions, you get these different curves shown in, in red and, and, and black. And you see that the results depend quite a lot on how many delta functions were used. And this is not good, right? Because then the question is, okay, how many should you use? Uh, the result depends on that number. So, so in some sense, it looks like now that, okay, Siliosen got rid of the problem of determining theta, but instead the results depend on uh, the number of delta functions. So then, okay, we have to determine that. That would be one approach to go about that. But more importantly, I, I noticed one thing here. Uh, if you look you know, below the edge of the spectrum here, you can see that as you increase the number of delta functions, you get more and more weight where there really should not be any weight at all. And then, <clears throat> luckily, I had, at this time, I had just been teaching undergraduate statistical mechanics, and I had talked about entropy. So I, I, because of that undergraduate knowledge that I fin finally obtained, I realized that this is because of entropic pressure, right? You, entropy wants to uh, uh, basically spread things out, right? So if there is some ability of the system to have weight there, you know, the entropy is increased by uh, putting weight there, even if there should be no weight there. Uh, because the temperature is kept fixed, uh, there's this entropic problem, okay? So that also means that chi squared, which is like uh, an average energy, is, is, is going up. Okay, so this is not something that would happen in normal statistical mechanics, but here chi squared is not exactly like a normal energy because it's not extensive. Normally you know, for an icing model or something like that. If you increase the system size, the energy increases as well. But chi-square doesn't have a natural property like that if we increase the number of delta functions. So the entropy is not kept in check by the internal energy here. So the en uh, entropy increases and then uh, the energy, uh, oh sorry, the energy increases because of this entropic effect. So then uh, this also suggests uh, uh, a cure for this. So you could actually say, well, let's see what happens if we don't allow any weight to, to go, uh, you know, to go here. For example, if I know where this edge is, then I can just say, okay, let's not uh, allow any weight below it. But of course, you may not know that. But then you can say, okay, if I <laughs> look at my results as a function of the lowest uh, energy I allow, uh, you can see how this entropic effect uh, will, will change. So if you look at the average chi-squared, and here it's normalized by the number of uh, time points, uh, you can impose some upper and lower bound and see what is the average chi-squared dependence on those bounds. So here I show results for fixed upper bounds as a function of the lower bound. And this line here is where the actual lower bound is. <clears throat> so what you can see here is that when I 
gradually disallow weight from the low frequency part, chi squared goes down, meaning the fit again becomes uh, better. Uh, and then at some point it shoots up. And why does it shoot up? Well, because if you don't allow weight where there should be weight, you know, clearly you cannot get a good fit. Uh, but the interesting thing is that at least if the upper bound is in a certain range, which is actually pretty close to where the actual upper bound is, <coughs> you get a minimum in, in, uh, in chi-square. So that suggests that, that this entropic effect can actually be used as a diagnostic tool and actually uh, adjust the, the bounds of the spectrum. Um, right, and then it turns out if you do that, you can get really, really good results. Um, shown here. So here I also did something else. So when you do this, this uh, sampling, uh, sorry, uh, when you sample these, uh, these delta functions, uh, you know, normally they fluctuate all over the place here. But let's say I have some more information. <clears throat> let's say that I know or strongly suspect that the spectrum has only a single peak. Then I can impose that there's only a single maximum in, in this uh, spectrum. And why do I do that? Well, because that's also something that reduces entropy, right? It reduces the size of the configuration space, so you may think that it, it can also alleviate some of these uh, uh, effects of entropy wanting to spread out uh, the weight. Uh, so if I do that, I look at uh, uh, this diagnostic to find the lower and upper bound, and then I have also imposed uh, the single peak in the spectrum but I don't tell it where the peak should be or, or any shape of the peak or anything. <clears throat> then the result is uh, uh, very good. And in fact, I, I would never myself have expected that it was this good. I mean, normally you cannot resolve things like that. <clears throat> and I cannot resist showing, uh, you know, what the referee of the paper said, because clearly he was also uh, quite uh, skeptical and thought that, okay, I, I compare with something I know, so then of course I have tweaked things and eventually reproduced that. But really, uh, this is what was done. It was using the entropy eff effect uh, as a diagnostic tool. And okay, I did assume that I have a single peak. Uh, and if I don't assume that, it doesn't look as good. It still looks quite okay, but not as good. Uh, Uh, that, that's right. It's, not, it's a little bit sensitive, but uh, basically not un until you go to some insane uh, uh, number of delta functions. It turns out that that kind of spectrum still has some entropic pressure. It turns out to make the peak very sharp. So if you go to higher and higher number of delta functions, this peak will be sharper and sharper, and eventually it will make the fit not being so good here, but it still will be okay here. So I think if you go to like a, a billion delta functions, maybe it will still be bad, but for any reasonable number of delta functions, it's good. Okay, so, so that worked uh, quite well, but turns out one can do even better. So now I will tell you about some uh, uh, work in progress. Uh, so one, one issue here is that these results that I showed you, it takes quite a long time actually to do uh, these, these kind of diagnostics and the sampling to get a smooth spectrum takes quite a long time and so on. <clears throat> so we have tried to improve things. Uh, so, you know, what I told you about up until now was that the spectrum is defined on a fixed frequency grid and we all, uh, sample the amplitudes of the delta function. So what we have been working with now is another parameterization where we basically just do a bunch of equal amplitude delta functions but they don't sit on a fixed grid, they, they, they move around. So the, sa the sampling is now of the frequencies instead of the amplitudes. <clears throat> and that turns out to be much faster, and we have some understanding of, of why the sampling is faster, but let me not get into that because it would take too long. But it's just a different parameterization, you, you may say, of, of the spectrum. <clears throat> 
and it's again very flexible. But okay, now I should mention that then we also need an underlying histogram here where we collect uh, you know, the hits, the number of delta functions that fall within a little frequency range. So in the end we collect a histogram right, of, of uh, the density distribution of, of these delta functions. Okay, so that we can do, and that's what we call free sampling if we only uh, sample those. Now, we do also want to build in certain information if we have it. So it turns out that if you have even some, you know, very small pieces of, of, of correct information, you can improve things a lot, as I showed you already with, in the previous example. So in this kind of parameterization, if we, for example, want to uh, sample a spectrum that we know has a sharp edge, or, or it has some edge, not a, not a smooth thing, but something that is a sharp cutoff. Uh, then we can use something like that, and let's say it has only one peak as well, so it has a, an edge with a peak. <clears throat> then we can impose that the distance between these delta functions is monotonically increasing. Then the density is highest here, so it means that there's a peak here, and then it falls off. And these guys can still, you know, move within that constraint. <clears throat> and then we can also build in other what we call prominent features, so for example, we can say that in, in in, for example, in the case I talked about here, that we have one uh, uh, delta function and a continuum. So then we can say that, okay, the lower edge has a delta function which has a different amplitude, and these guys represent the background, and that is uh, sampled. And, th and th this location can also be sampled, but the maximum or, or the amplitude can be fixed, and we want to determine the amplitude by this kind of uh, entropic diagnostics diagnostic similar to the edge I talked about before. <coughs> yeah, so <coughs> it can be hundreds or thousands. Well, what can, okay, we could do, you know, a million, but there's no point because the results will not change anymore. Um, so, and actually now I'm also, we are going back to, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, okay, so we are sampling, right? So it's not optimizing now, it's sampling at some <coughs> temperature, and actually it turns out the sampling is easier if you do many, but of course then it also takes longer because you have many. Uh, but we can come back to that a little bit uh, later. So now we are, let's say we are sampling with this space, and now I go back to having a theta there, because I think really the best way to uh, combat entropy is to, to lower the temperature. Uh, so. Uh, let, let, let's see what happens as a function of, of the fictitious temperature. And this is just for some case, it doesn't really matter what it is. <clears throat> so here's the normalized chi squared as a function of the log of, of that temperature. So lower temperature is to the left, but on a log scale. So when the temperature is high, you know, chi squared is too high, and then it goes down, and eventually it flattens out when, when you, you find the optimal value of chi squared. So then what we can say here is that, okay, here the temperature is too high. And here is, it's too low because here you are doing basically overfitting. The, the uh, distribution of delta functions start to adapt itself to the statistical errors. <clears throat> so then we just have a simple argument that, okay, the chi-squared distribution has some standard deviation, which is uh, uh, the square root of twice chi-squared itself. So we raise the temperature such that we go one standard deviation above the minimum. That should bring us into the regime where we don't fit to the error bars. And this turns out to be a very simple and uh, uh, thing that works quite well. <clears throat> and now the point is that if we increase the number of delta functions, this temperature will actually be lower because uh, there's uh, more entropic effects and need lower temperature to, to overcome it. But when you choose the temperature in this way, uh, as a function of the number of delta functions, now the result does not change anymore, as long as you have enough of them, like, like a few hundred or, or, or a few thousand. <clears throat> okay, so le let me show some movies here. So what I will show is uh, how the sample spectrum uh, evolves as a function of, of this temperature that we talked about. And again, I use uh, this you know, histogram for a small system size to compare with. So this is an example where I have used the fixed grid. Uh, and okay, 
it's, it, the average is smooth, so you don't see the grid, of course. <clears throat> and here, you know, the temperature is of this form, 10 times 1.1 to the minus n, and n will be increasing, so here n is 1, so this is something like the temperature is 10 here or something like that. Uh, and this shows, you know, what chi-squared, the normalized chi-squared is. So the normalized chi-squared statistically should be around 1 or a little, be little below uh, if you have a good fit. So clearly here the fit is not yet good. Um, and this is for, you know, the free sampling without the grid, and you see that the spectrum looks a little bit different. Chi-squared is lower. Uh, but now let's see what happens if I lower the temperature. So now I hope that this movie will play, and you see the, the, how this... Actually, let me run it again because I don't like what just showed up there. Um, oops. Um, so now you see, actually, maybe counterintuitively, uh, the shape spectrum becomes sharper uh, at some point when I decre increase, uh, decrease the temperature. But then it broadens out, and now you see it becomes very noisy. It's hard to sample it at this point because the temperature is too low. Now we go towards, uh, okay, now it already went, but you see we go towards the lowest chi-squared, and actually the spectrum starts to look completely wrong. So the spectra that have the best chi-squared, they are overfitting in a certain sense, and they also become, uh, in the end, quite simple. Actually, if we could do it perfectly, this would go to two delta functions. So this is, seems kind of crazy that the best fit is actually two delta functions, and we are trying to reproduce some continuous function, which it does sort of okay if we sample it at, at some uh, suitable temperature. But here you can see it, it still was uh, maybe not that great. Well, actually, there's some temperature where it is quite good, but um, uh, let's go to, to this other parameterization. Sorry, now I want to do it again. Uh, okay, so here you see that it's <coughs> this parameterization doesn't have such a huge sensitivity on the temperature until the temperature becomes, you know, very low. Then again, it starts to look pretty similar to that other case. And here you can see more clearly that, that this may go to, to basically two delta functions in the end. Okay, but so there's this <coughs> special temperature here that we will eventually use, which is, you know, one standard deviation above the minimum. Uh, right, so let, let me show, uh, quickly announce uh, 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 one application that we have done with, with this kind of free sampling uh, of the de equal amplitude delta functions. So this is an archive, and actually it just so happens that PRL has promised us to publish it today, so it may, <laughs> if we are lucky, it's, it's on, in PRL today. <clears throat> uh, okay, so this is motivated by this thallium copper chloride that I uh, talked about yesterday a little bit. So we have not studied the, the uh, lattice of, of this model, but, we, but one of these lattices that I mentioned yesterday, a couple cubed, a couple cube. Uh, and the point is that we want to study the amplitude mode. So you know, the, the, the spin waves, those are transversal fluctuations uh, or transverse modes, uh, and there's also an amplitude mode that is illustrated here, where it's actually the, the amplitude of the local order parameter that is fluctuating. And this has this well-known, you know, Goldstone Mexican hat uh, description, where uh, due to the spin rotation symmetry, you have this degeneracy of in what direction the order parameter points. But if you change the amplitude of the order parameter, you, you increase the energy. Uh, so uh, basically, we, we would like to see if we can detect uh, the, the amplitude mode, which uh, is similar to, you know, the Higgs mode in particle physics, although particle physicists uh, cringe a little bit when we, we say that because we don't couple to any, any gauge mode in this case. <coughs> but there, is, there should be such an amplitude mode, and actually we can detect it. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, this, this is for some system size, maybe 16 cubed or something like that, for different couplings close to this critical coupling, which is where we can uh, see, see this Higgs mode, otherwise it, it's somehow not visible. <coughs> and um, here you can see that there's actually a huge delta function here, which corresponds to, uh, you know, the Goldstone mode, uh, the, the lowest uh, uh, 
uh, state in this Anderson uh, tower of, of uh, quantum rotor states. And then we see some peak above that. And this is in, in the spin sector with this S operator that I told you before. <coughs> so this detects uh, a, a spin one mode there. And we are actually also looking at this in the singlet sector. So we can look at an operator which excites only singlets. And then we see something like this. And if you look at, at carefully at scaling with size and so on, this peak is actually at the same uh, energy as that peak. So we think that this is some sort of singlet and triplet uh, version of, of, uh, of this uh, longitudinal fluctuation. Basically, the, the triplet one, the, the longitudinal mode should be a singlet mode in some sense, but uh, you can also uh, combine it with a zero energy spin wave and detect it in, in, in the triplet channel. Okay, so <laughs> I don't want to discuss that in too much detail. Let me just show what we get now with this. If we want to try to look at the 1D Heisenberg chain with this kind of, of sample spectrum where we impose the edge, then again it works extremely well, even better than before. And actually here we don't have to, to look for the optimal lower and higher edge. It turns out that this comes out immediately with this parametrization because we have not... Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this can already adjust itself to find a lower edge, which the, the, the fixed grid cannot. In the fixed grid, you have to tell, like, tell it, okay, where is the lowest one? And sort of, uh, again, it's <coughs> even for myself a bit unbelievable that th this can adapt so well, and, uh, but somehow it does. Uh, if we somehow know where the lowest edge is, it, it works even better. So here you can see maybe that there's a little bit weight uh, below where it actually should be. Uh, but if we put that in, and in some cases you actually do know the lowest energy, then it, it's even better. Uh, related to Arnab's pre previous question, there is still a little bit uh, uh, entropic bias in, in this parameterization too, which uh, sometimes wants to make this, this peak a little bit too sharp. Uh, but overall, I, I would say it's working surprisingly well. Let me show, show you some other test cases that we have done. <clears throat> so this is something that's very hard to do. This is based on synthetic data, actually. We can just create a, a spectrum like this one, go to G of tau, and just add some noise to that to, to mimic what happens in the simulation. So if you have a, a delta function and uh, you know, some, some, back, uh, some, some higher feature like that, if you just do this free sampling and the data is pretty noisy, you can never resolve the delta function very well. You just get something broad like that. <clears throat> so, so this is why often we want to actually build in a delta function if we suspect that there should be one. Otherwise, we can never really uh, resolve it. So now we can do something similar to this entropic uh, diagnostic test. We can say, OK, let's put a delta function. We don't say where it, I mean, uh, uh, let's say the lower edge delta function. We give it some amplitude, but we don't tell it, tell it where it should be. And everything, uh, all the frequencies are sampled. <clears throat> and then we can actually look at how chi-square depends on the amplitude, the relative amplitude that we uh, uh, put for, for that delta function. And again, it's something like before. There's a minimum which happens to be really exactly at the correct value. Uh, and then you see that the location is still sampled, so there's some fluctuation. These error bars reflect the fluctuations of its location during the sampling, and when A0 reaches, it correct, it reaches its correct value, which is a third, then the location is also correct. So this works, again, extremely well. <coughs> uh, and if we plot the spectrum now, also the second feature is very well reproduced. Okay, now this, is, this case is a bit easy in the sense that there's almost a gap between these two features. Let me just show you that we can also deal with cases, not quite as well, but still, if, uh, so this is just a, a half Gaussian which is cut off at, at the location of the delta function, and uh, the red one and the black curve is what we get from, from this approach. But now you can see that and the minimum in chi-squared is not as pronounced, but there is still a minimum. You can do some function fitting to locate it better. Uh, and okay, we, we make some error around here, but overall it's still uh, quite good. 
So now let, let me discuss these new results. I think I have seven minutes left or something like that, right? Okay, nine minutes, great. Then I may actually get through everything. <laughs> okay, uh, so I, I already talked about these old results that we had for the dynamic structure factor of the Heisenberg model. So now we have applied exactly this approach that I just uh, talked about. So we do impose that there's a delta function, so the assumption is that there is one, uh, but we don't know uh, how big it is, and then we have, have the, uh, the continuum after. So these are now some uh, selected uh, results at different uh, momenta in the Brillouin zone. So this is work done again with my postdoc uh, Wei Xiao and, and <coughs> collaborators in, in China and Sylvain Capone, some of you may know him, he's visiting BU this year as a, on sabbatical. And Stefano Chese, he's also uh, he's a professor actually in, in Beijing. <coughs> uh, okay, so we, this is again to show that in chi squared we, we find these minimas corresponding, these correspond to these pictures here. Um, so it, it, seems, it seems like, uh, you know, we can confirm in some sense that there is a delta function there. <coughs> Although if it's, you know, not a delta function, just a sharp peak, I think, you know, we would also see this feature. So that's why I still want to be, uh, stress that the assumption really is that there is a delta function. Um, okay. Now we can compare with experiments because, uh, as was also mentioned, I think at some point uh, today or was it yesterday, that uh, there are lots of experiments, good, good realizations of the 2D Heisenberg model. <laughs> so this is supposedly the best realization of the Heisenberg model so far, uh, the 2D Heisenberg model. It's, it's uh, weakly coupled uh, planes of this chemical compound. <clears throat> and uh, there's, there's, there are many papers on this compound, but there's uh, a very interesting paper from uh, uh, 2015 where they actually claim that there are fractional excitations in the 2D Heisenberg model, meaning that there's not just spin waves, there are some other fractional excitations. <clears throat> okay, so what uh, the experimental data looks like is, is these uh, at, at, you know, two wave uh, uh, numbers. So the, the claim, by the way, in the paper is that around this wave number, the excitations are uh, deconfined spin-ons, meaning spin one-half objects that we have uh, heard about. <clears throat> and, and the reason that for that claim is that the spectral function is very broad. You see these blue, blue dots here, they're very broad. Uh, whereas at pi over 2, pi over 2, the claim is, is that it's still magnons, and so it's more sharp. Of course, the experiments, they, they cannot re also resolve a delta function, so there's some broadening, even if there would be a delta function. <clears throat> and our results can actually match this very well. If we just take our results and we use the value of J according to the experiments, and we just adjust the overall, uh, an overall factor, because you know, in neutron scattering, they just count events, so they don't get the normalized wave function, but we use the same broadening in both of them and the same amplitude adjustments in, in both of them. And you see that this agrees very well, and it could even be made to agree better if we adjust J a little bit, because of course J is known only up to some, some error bar. And if we look at in, in the whole Brillouin zone, we can look at, at the location of the delta functions of the lowest excitation energy. And this is now compared with linear spin wave theory, and we show the experiments and our results. Now, the, 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 the interest in, in, in this uh, kind of thing uh, for many years has been in the fact that there's an anomaly here close to pi zero. You see, lin linear spin wave theory just gives a flat uh, uh, energy here, but uh, many calculations, and including our uh, current one, show that there's a, a dip there. And that may appear to be small, but it turns out that you cannot really d explain that dip in spin wave theory, even if you go to very high order. The spin wave theory seems to converge well, but it doesn't converge to where uh, many calculations show that it, it should be. <coughs> That's right. Yep, nothing else, just 2D Heisenberg model. Right. Uh, okay, so, so now the suggestion from this experimental collaboration is that, uh, you know, there, there should be uh, deconfined spinners. Uh, well, 
what we can also look at here is, okay, uh, how does this amplitude... Uh, so in, in our case, we, we see that there's a delta function. So in our calculation, we would say, well, this is wrong. There is a delta function there. And we can also repro reproduce the experiment. So we don't think that there's deconfined spinos. But it's still interesting to see that the amplitude of the delta function is the smallest close to pi zero. I guess it should be the smallest at pi zero, but our data is a bit, bit noisy and so on. Uh, and it, it's pretty high at pi over 2, pi over 2. So then you can ask, well, what is causing this reduction? So now to get some further insights into this, we have looked at, at the JQ model, where, um, as I talked about yesterday, we can bring it into another phase if this Q interaction is strong. If we look at uh, pi over 2, pi over 2, and we look at as a function of Q over J, then the critical point is around 22 uh, in the JQ model. Uh, but you, and you see here that as a function of that parameter at pi over 2, pi over 2, uh, the excitation energy normalized by J plus Q just goes up a little bit, uh, and the amplitude in the delta function is still you know, above 70%. So that, that's pretty stable. Uh, and this is for some system size. I think it's 32 squared. But when you go to pi zero, then we see something really amazing. We see that... Uh, well, first the energy goes down. I will discuss that a bit uh, more in a bit. Uh, but more importantly, the delta function really seems to go away. Uh, actually, we have better data now. We have one point in between here too. So there's a, a, a sharp but uh, still uh, a continuous drop in the weight in the delta function. And this drop happens you know, way before the deconfined critical point. Um, so the effects are big at close to pi zero, but small at pi over two, pi over two. So uh, uh, we know actually from other work and some general considerations that uh, when we get the transition into the VBS, uh, we should actually get a gapless triplet at pi zero. So the fact that the energy goes down uh, is not so surprising. And the fact that it's not zero here is just a finite size effect. It actually drops to zero uh, very slowly. But uh, the, the main uh, surprise here is that the weight in the delta function goes uh, so, so small so quickly. So our interpretation of this is that in the pure Heisenberg model, we still have magnon excitations, but there's a, a big continuum. Uh, but with just a little bit of Q interaction and probably other kinds of interactions as well, the magnon goes away, meaning that the spinons become deconfined uh, close to uh, pi zero. So you would still have magnons uh, uh, almost everywhere. You would still have magnons here and here, but here you would have spinners. Yeah. Two, uh, two uh, right. Right. So, uh, is there a possibility that these are magnets for the 1D physics? Yeah, yeah, so, the, so there's some re resemblance to, 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 to 1D physics here, but it's not clear, real clear. I mean, it's at pi zero, so, you know, that means that you're propagating along the, you know, right. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, I'm almost running out of time, so maybe we can discuss uh, that more after. It's very interesting. We actually have some, <coughs> some theory uh, where we can, uh, actually phenomenologically explain this within a toy model that mixes magnons and spinons. So the magnon basically propagates, but it can decay into a pair of spinons, but there's some energy to break it up, and then it recombines and so on. So it's, uh, it's actually, it's, for those of you who may know, the exciton polariton problem, it, it's a bit similar to that in, in our toy model. And the reason that the effect is close to pi zero uh, is because, uh, you know, the, at, at the cr critical point, eventually the spinons are gapless at pi zero. So you can think of it as the magnon has some dispersion and the spinons have some dispersion, which is gapless at pi zero, and that's why, you know, they can couple uh, the best at close to pi zero, because that's where their energies are. The, uh, the spinon energy can go closest to the magnon energy if they are not really deconfined. So the, Energy is still above, but it's the closest. Okay, so I, I, this is really uh, everything I wanted to do. So I think I should should stop here. So thank you. <clears throat>
Right. So if we think about spin waves, then of course you have the one peak, and immediately after that there's the free magnum continuum, which right. touches the. Right. So regarding this, I have two questions. Okay. So one question is that, I mean, I believe, or I don't know, I believe that there must be some, some, some predictions of how the free magnum continuum would appear in SK omega, right. starting from spin wave. How yeah, does yeah, it from, match? Yeah, yeah, okay, so let me talk about that. So as I mentioned, the spin, wa spin wave theory cannot really uh, you know, capture this dip here. If you go to high order spin wave theory, people have done up to one over S cubed, in fact. <laughs> you, you see a little bit dip here, but it doesn't appear that it, you could capture uh, you know, the whole thing. And if you lo uh, look at the weight uh, in the continuum, I think it's something like 3%. Or, or something very small. So spin wave theory cannot capture this big uh, weight in the continuum. But people have done other more sophisticated things. So Götz Urig and his collaborators, <coughs> they are doing this, what they call unitary, continuous unitary transformations. And I don't know the details, but it's basically something where they can formulate it as an expansion in, in multi-magnon processes. And, and they actually get something which agrees really well with our results, right? Uh, we, with our, you know, quantum Monte Carlo results. <clears throat> so then it, it appears that there's a little bit of conflict between their calculation, which clearly is a calculation involving magnons, and our scenario that uh, basically makes an effective model where the magnon decays into spinons. But in the end, you know, in the Heisenberg model, we still say that it's magnons. It's just that the magnon has some internal structure that contains spinners, so it's not necessarily in conflict with their uh, scenarios. I think what I hope that they will eventually do is the calculation, including the Q term, and then we can see if their calculation really breaks right. down at some point. Right, right, so maybe misunderstanding. So spin wave, I meant magnon, that elementary excitation, so magnon, whether multi-magnon, whatever. Right. Spinons are not magnons. That's right. So coming back to this Q picture, so if you have a free magnon continuum, then it may happen that the one magnon branch is within the continuum, and that causes that you, you, you that the delta p decays, and simply your elementary excitations are still magnons. Right. But simply, the the one magnon mode disappears because it's inside the continuum, and you you cannot see it. Uh, yeah, it yeah, yeah. I guess that that's a, that's also a possibility. Right. So. Uh, it, it, Right. Uh, yeah, but I think if, if the delta function is inside the continuum, I mean, like you said, then it would probably decay, right? So in the end, there is no delta function then. Right. 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 Yeah, so yeah, I, I guess that can happen too. Right. So if, if, if you talk about the longitudinal part, right. I mean, you showed it for your, I mean, I tried to get, fetch your paper from 2001, but it didn't work. Right. So in you, you showed also the longitudinal. Yeah, so in that case, actually, we did a calculation which uh, included a small uh, staggered field so that we could actually separate uh, the longitudinal and transversal part, which we haven't done in this most recent calculation, unfortunately, so we, we should probably, right. probably do that. Um, yeah, so that, that may, may give us some more information if we do that. Yes, because then we would expect the two-magnon continuum that gives the response, yep, and yeah, how much it. does it, how much is the... Yeah, yeah, so, so the weight in that we, we did in our old calculation, and it's, it's pretty significant, I forget, but 20, 30 percent, something like that. It, it's a big, big contribution. Sorry, uh, you mentioned at the end the uh, JQ model. Right. Uh, Physically, we would expect the far side ring exchange. How much is Q related to the far okay, side so, ring yeah, so, exchange? Okay, so the Q term is uh, a, a subset of the full uh, ring exchange. So, you know, if you uh, think of uh, the ring exchange in terms of, you know, S dot S, and then there's some other S dot S, uh, then, uh, you know, there's one where this one and that one sits like that, and one where they sit like that and one where, where they cross each other. So the Q term doesn't contain you know, the one where they cross. And furthermore, the Q term has the wrong sign. The, the true ring exchange that you derive from the Hubbard model comes with the opposite sign. So in that sense, <coughs> you know, it's related, but it, it's not really the ring exchange of, of the Hubbard model. <coughs>
Thank you.